Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. You may be seated. I want to welcome you to today's closing session. The, the last part of tonight's program that we just witnessed with amazing testimonies, really, really amazing testimonies. I thought that should not end, it should just go on. Wow. Have you ever been in a meeting where you have 30 testimonies under one roof of those who were raised from the dead or those who raised others from the dead? Have you ever been in such a meeting? 30 people. 30 testimonies, and everything influenced by the same instrumentality. Not just gathering, you know, wherever did anybody rise from the dead? Oh, please. No, 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 but the same story, same story. Pointing back to the same instrumentality. Of a book. That's amazing. That's extraordinary. That's extraordinary. It's remarkable. And that's because it was God's plan. It was God's plan. There's no way a human being can, can set that up. You can't organize that. You can't do it. You can't do it. That's the grace of God. Amazing stories. Amazing stories. Thank God for the power of his word. You see, faith comes by hearing. And hearing by the word of God. God's word produces faith. Think about the lady who shared with us. Even after the womb was emptied, she kept her confession, her declaration of faith. And when, when her faith got shaken a little bit and she thought, oh, maybe it's over. And the voice of the spirit said, no. Are you going to rely on the ultra scans report 
or on the word of God. She made the choice, the word of God. And she continued declaring it. There's something about faith that needs to be understood. You know, um, the definition of faith that's given us in a scripture in Hebrews chapter 11, when you read in verse 1, faith it says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. That definition. is an explanation as God and the Spirit presents it to man. In the Spirit, it's not put in those words. In the Spirit, it's not in words. Faith is seen in the spirit. You remember what the Bible says, how Jesus was preaching in the house. While he was preaching in this house, which turned out to be his house. Four men brought their friend, the paralytic, and they tore up the roof and dropped their friend right in the presence of Jesus. The Bible says, when Jesus saw their faith, when he saw their faith, he wasn't seeing an explanation. He wasn't seeing a definition. He saw their faith. What did he see? And if you've read Rhapsody long enough, you would have seen the statement I'm going to make now because it's in Rhapsody. I said, faith is the response of the human spirit to the word of God. See, that is from God's perspective. Faith is the response of the human spirit to the word of God. It's not the response of your brain. It's not the response of your mind. It's the response of your spirit. That's why our dear sister, the medical doctor, who shouldn't have had a baby anymore in our womb, could still say, my baby is alive. My baby is growing in my womb. What happened to her? It was the response of her spirit to the word of God. The response of her spirit. Faith is the response of the human spirit to the word of God. Because faith, you see, comes by hearing, hearing, hearing. And how does hearing come? For one who didn't have any hearing, whether it was the hearing of the ear or the hearing of the soul, how does it come? The word of God. God's word is penetrating. God's word can get anywhere. That's why you can speak to a deaf ear and tell the deaf ear to open up and respond to you. <laughs> it's supposed to be deaf. And yet, it can hear you. God's word can get anywhere. 
Really amazing testimonies. Really amazing. Really amazing. And the pastor said, he put the rhapsody under his back while he was lying on the bed and said to the doctor, don't you dare remove this rhapsody. <laughs> then something quite interesting, he said, if you mess this thing up, <laughs> he said, just will me out the whole way to my wife and she will raise me back to life. Isn't that wonderful? There was a determination A determination not to go the way they said he would go. Said, I'll, I'll, I'll go to God on my terms, not on medical terms. And God likes that. Do you know that? Do you know God likes that? God likes that. He likes for his children to make decisions. Decisions. That's why he gave you his word. His word is his material to help you make the right decisions. That's why it's so important to, to learn God's word. For example, when you read in, uh, let me show you something. In first epistle of St. John. Go to chapter 5. From verse 14. And this is the confidence that we have in him. That if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. Now a lot of times, many don't understand this verse. They think he is saying that what you have to ask from God should be according to his will, if God is willing for what you're asking for. So they think he means to say to them, if you ask God for something, you got to be sure that God is willing to do it. But that's not what that verse is saying at all. Let's read it fully. We'll read it into the 15th verse. And this is the confidence that we have in him. That if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. And if we know that he hears us, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desire of him. Did you see that? If any man see his brother sin a sin which is not unto death, he shall ask and he shall give him life for them that sin not unto death. There is a sin unto death. I do not say that he shall pray for it. All unrighteousness is sin. And there's a sin not unto death. Then he continues into uh, a larger part of the discussion. What John is telling you here, remember, this is the same John that gave us the master's message on prayer like no one else did. He explained Jesus' message on prayer 
that you don't find in Matthew, Mark, or Luke. Only in John. John gave us what Jesus said about prayer. Prayer in the new contract. Nobody else talked about it. You don't find it in the synoptic gospels. Only in John. So let me take you there. It starts like this. It's a long discussion. So, in St. John's Gospel, chapter 14, from verse 12, this discussion started in chapter 13. It's a beautiful, beautiful, long discussion with Jesus speaking to his disciples. And he touched on many subjects. In his preparation for his death. Because he was leaving the disciples very soon. So he taught them many things. Verily, verily, I say unto you, verse 12. He that believeth on me, the works that I do, shall he do also. In greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my father. And whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. See, he's talking about what will happen hereafter. That means after he's done with them, because he's going to the cross, and after that he will ascend, he told them he would send the Holy Spirit. So he says, whatsoever you shall ask. So just in case you missed that in the 12th verse, I want to take you back to verse 12. Look what he says. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the works that I do shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do because I go. See, I'm leaving. I'm leaving. Next, and whatsoever you shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. You don't find this in the other writings. Then it takes us to another one, chapter 16. This is the real one on prayer. Those parts are a certain kind of prayer. Okay? This one now is different. You would notice something. Chapter 16. And we're reading from verse 22. And ye now therefore have sorrow because it says, but I will see you again. Still talking about his leaving. So because he told them he'll leave, they're sorrowful. And Jesus says, but I'll see you again and your heart shall rejoice. In your joy, no man take it from you. And in that day, uh-oh, what day could this be? Okay. And in that day you shall ask me nothing. This is amazing. This is certainly not 
the millennium nor in heaven? It's a day of the new contract when it comes to us through the Holy Spirit. So he's not referring to the day of the rapture. He's not referring to the second coming. He's not referring to the millennium. He's not referring to heaven. It's the day of the New Testament. That is the day you and I are living in. Here's what he said about prayer. Everything about prayer changes. Everything about prayer changes. He teaches them about prayer. Watch. And in that day, you shall ask me nothing. Verily, verily, I say unto you, whatsoever you shall ask the Father in my name, he will give it to you. Here is the new rule for prayer. For prayer in that day. Hitherto, up till now, have ye asked nothing in my name. Ask, and you shall receive, that your joy may be full. This is what John was talking about. He was talking about the new will. Paul called it the new will. When you read in the book of Hebrews, see, it says a will is without power until the death of the one who made it. And he told us this new will is where we live now. The new will. Satisfied, activated by the death of Jesus Christ. Now go back to First John chapter five, verse thirteen. Now you're going to see it more clearly. It says these things. No, no, verse fourteen. We were in verse verse fourteen. And this is the confidence that we have in him. That if we ask anything according to his will, what's that? According to his will for asking. Can you see that now? You have to ask according to his will for asking. What is his will for asking? You ask the Father in the name of Jesus. So he wasn't putting new conditions for prayer. Like it's got to be consistent with my will. So you, you want to ask for something, you, you have to first find out whether it is consistent with his will. What do you mean what is consistent with his will? There was no clause when he said it in the first time. So whatever you ask the father in my name, he'll give it to you. There was no clause. So he's not... John is not going to bring in a new clause. In fact, when you read in the epistle of John, that first epistle of John, John reminded us on several occasions of what Jesus said. Jesus' instructions. He pointed us again and again to the instructions of Jesus. The definite instructions of Jesus. So he wasn't bringing a new class. So you might say, what if, if somebody is asking for something that's not God's will? A child of God does not ask God for something that is not God's will. 
That's why the Holy Spirit came to live in you. So you will never have to be wondering what is God's will. The Holy Spirit came to guide you in God's will. And remember, he says, all the promises of God in Christ Jesus are yes. And in him, amen to the glory of God. All his promises are yes. I told you about his promises. You remember? Yeah. If you've been watching your Love Word specials, you'd know. <clears throat> Glory be to God. This is, this is remarkable. This is why you can, it, this is why your faith can be strong. Your faith is weakened when you're debating whether it's God's will or not. Faith is weakened. Did you know? Did you know? Jesus was God's will manifested to us. Oh boy. This is so important. Jesus was God's will manifested to us. He was the will of the Father unveiled to us. If you ever wanted to know the will of God, all you need is Jesus. Look at Jesus. He is the will of God manifested. If that's true, Ah, so what are you supposed to be? Can I tell you? You were born to be the will of the Father manifested to the world. That's why you got to grow in Christ. Grow in Christ. This is God's vision for you. This is God's dream for you. This is God's plan for you. You're the will of God manifested. It's a pastor Chris. Is that, okay, okay, let me show it to you. Oh, thank you, Lord. Macro, sivro, kela, kratz, kids. Uh, uh, let me read you several scriptures, okay? Can I read you several scriptures? I hope I get the time. Yesterday, I spoke for longer than I thought I was going to speak. Because I was looking at the clock over there, and it, it turned out that clock was wrong. It was like <laughs> almost one and a half hours behind, behind time. I was looking at it. So I hope it's correct today. <laughs> okay. So... Yeah, because um, I'm sharing things with you that are not what I'm, what I'm, uh, what I plan to discuss. So, but you are pulling this. Okay, so let me give it to you. So let's go to second epistle of St. John. It's only one chapter. Malo cruci practile grace. I'm going to read from verse one. <clears throat> the elder onto the. Uh, it's amazing the way he puts this particular writing. You think he's being stylish, but it's modern style. It's modern style. You have to remember what was going on at the time and why he had to write like this. 
the elder unto the elect lady and her children, whom I love in the truth. And not I only, but also all they that have known the truth. Here's something remarkable. I'm not going to explain everything um, because of too many digressions, okay? But this is Rapathon. Is it Rapathon? Okay. So, um, he addresses this lady and her children. What's the lady and her children? Okay. During your love world specials, I'll, I'll give you more details. But, uh, so, that's like the church and the members. Okay, just think like that for the moment. All right. Okay, then it says, whom I love in the truth, and not I only, but also all they that have known the truth. All they that have known the truth. Oh, what is the truth? Do you remember Pilate asking Jesus, what is truth? For the truth. Oh boy, I love this verse. Verse 2, it's one of the most powerful verses in all the word of God. Through the years, I, 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 don't, I don't think I've, I've read this verse without having my stomach stared. Something moves within Like when, you say, Pastor Chris, how can you know that? Like a baby kicks in a woman's womb. That's the way I feel every time I read this verse. Every time. This verse I'm going to read to you now. For the truth's sake, which dwelleth in us and shall be with us forever. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord. It, it's, it's simple when you hear it, but this is, how can I say to you, this is the gospel in one verse, encapsulated in one verse. So powerful. I'll discuss it another day. For the truth's sake which dwelleth in us and shall be with us forever. Grace be with you. Mercy and peace from God the Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father, in truth and love. What's happening here? We're only in verse 3. How many times did he mention truth? Look at in verse 1. Truth. And then truth. And then you go to verse 2. Truth. That's how many times? That's three times, right? And then truth again in verse 4. Four times. In three verses. And you add verse 4 to it, he mentions truth there again. That's five times in four verses. There must be something. And you go into the third epistle. He goes about it same way. He's talking about this truth. The truth, the truth. And he remembers so well. And Pilate asked, what is truth? John remembers. When Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Luke doesn't tell you that. Mark doesn't tell you that. 
Matthew doesn't tell you that. This was significant. And John was written after the other three. He had to give us this information that we needed to have. Jesus, God's truth revealed to us. Remember in his prayer, St. John's Gospel. All of this is in St. John. In St. John's Gospel, chapter 17, he was praying. He said, thy word is truth. In his prayer to the Father, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. John was not merely fascinated with this. He embraced it. But he was not the only one. I said, this is the gospel. The knowledge of this is the gospel because truth is reality. Truth is how the Father sees it. That's why Jesus said, Thy word, God's word, is truth. No matter what you see, no matter what you experience, the word is truth. The word is truth. So when Jesus came, he was God's truth walking the streets. So if Jesus came into your house, the truth came into your house. That's amazing. The light that lights every man that comes into the world. He called him the truth. Now, let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. We're going to read from verse 1. This is Paul now. This is not John. This is Paul now, okay? Writing to the Corinthians. Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not. But have renounced the hidden things of this honesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending our zeros to every man's conscience in the sight of God. This is amazing. We live. By manifestation of the truth. Paul says, this is my life. The manifestation of the truth. Jesus was the manifestation of the truth. Now Paul speaks, not just himself. He and his companions, as you can see there. We. Read again, look at verse 1. Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not, but have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth. Hallelujah. So your everyday walk is the manifestation of the truth. Your life is the manifestation of the truth. Are you seeing it now? This is how God sees you. This is the life that you must live. This is who you are. See? 
That's the will of God. The manifestation of the truth is the manifestation of God's will. Do you get it now? That's amazing. Imagine, imagine when you wake up every day thinking, I'm the manifestation of the truth. I am the manifestation of the will of God. Your life takes on a new meaning. See? Every day you realize you're living a great life. Your life is tremendous. Think about it. Remember, he gave us his word for us to live. Not just so we could read it and be blessed. No, no, no. The word was given to us so we would be the manifestation of the word. We are the expression of the word. Jesus. The living word. Jesus. The word of God manifested to us. The word became flesh. And dwelt among us. Who are you? Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, by the logos of God, which liveth and abideth forever. I'm the offspring of the word. So I'm the manifestation of the word. My life is the word of God. In manifestation. My life. Is the gospel. Unveiled. I Do you know that? Do you know that? Do you know that? That's in the scripture by the way. That's. That's scripture. That's scripture. Hallelujah. Okay, can I manage to get into what I wanted to discuss? Oh, glory be to God. You know, I can, I can, I can sit here and just be sharing God's word. And then all the night will pass and the morning will come. Go through the afternoon back to the night and I'll still be here talking. It's true. It's true. It's true. I, I've, I've had people listen to me for hours. Hours. And then we just don't get tired. You know why? Because the more we hear it, the more strength we have. We are full. The more glory. The only people that get tired like that are those who are thinking about their flesh. Every now and then they are thinking, like, I got to go to the bathroom. I got to go to the bathroom. I said, bathroom where? Well, what do you mean bathroom? When your body is listening, as your ears are listening, and your spirit is listening, the word soaks your being. There's where suddenly you start noticing the symptoms you were having for this or that or the other. You're not feeling that anymore. It's not there anymore. I tell pastors, I say, 
if you give God's word in the spirit as you're supposed to, you're going to find that people just come to your church and they just get healed. They just notice that after attending your church service, they're healed. No one's praying for them. They just come in and, and they notice they are well. Just by coming in. He sent his word and delivered them. And what? He healed them and delivered them. His word is what? Mape. Medicine. Send his word and heal them and deliver them from all their destructions. Send his word. They're just there listening. And the heart trouble is gone. The head trouble is gone. The stomach trouble is gone. The skin trouble is gone. And the demons are gone. Glory be to God. You're still there? All right, let's see if we can get in. Looks like we get in and we get out. We get in and we get out. So, um, Romans chapter 1. I want to read to you from verse 9. I want to read a few verses. From verse 9. For God is my witness whom I serve with my spirit that is remarkable that's amazing god he says is my witness whom i serve with my spirit In the gospel of his son. I serve God with my spirit. That's amazing. That's amazing. God is my witness whom I serve with my spirit. I serve God with my spirit. Not in my flesh. This is the real divine worship. What you do continually. When you worship God, your life is a life of worship. You're serving God with your spirit. See, you... you that's why we have to train God's people to respond to God with their spirit. I just told you, faith is a response of the human spirit to the word of God. And how do you serve God? You serve God with your spirit. In, in the New Testament, you got several words that are translated into the English as worship. This is one of them, latrio. It's, it's, it's one of those words. Serve God. The other one, which more are familiar with, which is translated into worship many more times, proskuneo, is an act. That's an act, an act of worship. Like you, when, when, when in, in St. John, uh, in Matthew's fourth chapter, in the temptation of Jesus, Read when the devil said to him, after showing him the kingdoms of the world in the moment of time, he said, all these I'll give to you if you just fall down and worship me. And Jesus said, 
it is written. Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shall thou serve. So worship there is an act. Like when you are in the, in the service and you're lifting your hands, that's worship, right? But that's just an act of worship. And you're singing. You say, well, we're worshiping him. That's an act. Or you bow your knees or you prostrate. Those are acts. See? Those are acts. Then you have another one that's a state of mind. State of mind. Sebamai. It's, it's a state of mind. Sebamai. When, you know, when you say someone is um, religious. Like the lady in Thyatira, in the Bible. In the Bible, we're told she was a worshiper of God. It just meant that she was religious. That's what the Bible says. She was, she was religious. Or the devout Jews uh, and devout Greeks, they were religious. So this was a state of their mind. They're, they're kind of like, okay, oh, um, when you get to that place, you have to bow because, you know, uh, the something there, the, the presence of God is in that place. You know, they, they're religious. They do certain religious things. They follow certain, not because they know God, not even because they love him. And that's what Jesus was referring to. He says, these people, they are with me with their mouth and their lips, but their hearts are far from me. See, you still there? Okay, let, let's take a look at one of them. Go to Sir um, Matthew's Gospel, chapter 15. Let's read from verse 8. It says, These people draw nigh, draw it nigh unto me with their mouths and honor it me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Look at the next verse. But in vain do they worship me. See? In vain do they worship me. Teaching for doctrines or commandments of men. Because their hearts are far from God. Or they say things, repeat words that are religious. Maybe in prayer or something. But serving God with your spirit is different. Hallelujah. In the New Testament, that's what we do. We serve God with our spirits. And that's why I also shared with you, when you sing to God, sing from your spirit to God. Don't just do it in the flesh. Dancing in the flesh will never help you. And, and there's a quick way. Learn. Tell somebody close to you, are you listening? Now, this is important. Because in, in the church, a lot of people don't get in the flow very quickly. Sometimes a whole service can pass without them ever responding with their spirit to God. They're there, they're looking, they're hearing the song, they're singing the songs with their lips, but they're thinking of other things. Their, their minds are racing through other thoughts. Their spirit is not responding because they haven't known how to discipline their spirits. But they have to be taught. Then that's a responsibility. 
of pastors. But you see, a pastor can't teach what he doesn't know. So if a pastor doesn't know it, how is he going to teach it? He has to know it first. Learn very quickly to respond to God with your spirit. When in, in the house of God and you're singing to worship God, immediately key in with your spirit. With your spirit. Withdraw your attention from other things and focus your attention in the spirit. Practice serving God with your spirit. Practice. You got to practice. You have to practice. Practice until it becomes your way of life. Didn't he tell us to walk in the spirit? What do you think he was talking about? A way of life. Walking in the spirit. Continually. But you have to train. Train yourself to be that way. Train yourself to be that way. So there's a consciousness of the kingdom of God that you carry every day. So you realize that you're living in two worlds at the same time. See, you live in this world, but you're not of this world. But at the same time, you're living in a kingdom of which you are a part. So you're more conscious of that kingdom. While you're functioning in this world. Only by so doing will you apply the principles of your kingdom in this world. then you understand what Paul was saying. We walk by faith, not by sensory perception. We walk by faith. So you have to read that, that verse in the context of that chapter. Second Corinthians chapter 5. You have to read in context to understand what he was talking about. So you realize that you're actually living from inside out. You're living from your spirit. You follow what I'm telling you? Then your whole body will comply with your spirit. Your whole body will comply. And this is important. Because, you know, um, the, the, sometimes people have asked questions like, oh, so-and-so was a great evangelist. Why did, he, why, did he, why did he get sick and even die sick? God is not obligated to keeping you in health. That's not his job. Health is not a reward for your service of God he doesn't reward you with good health because you've been serving him oh Lord I've been serving you why am I like this why am I going through this he's not going to keep you in good health because you've been serving him the Bible doesn't say so your reward of good service is in heaven. Do you get it? When we get there, he will announce it. He will announce what your reward. Then you go back to the new earth to enjoy it. <laughs> you didn't get it. You didn't get it. Well, that's what the Bible says. Even the, you know, we talk about the millennial kingdom. The millennium, the 1,000 years of peace, 
is not about us. It's not about us. It's about Israel. He promised them 1,000 years of peace. So they're going to get it. We will be with Jesus. And we're, we're making sure everything's going on fine. For those 1,000 years, we are the bosses. Our ministry is not for the, for the millennium. We don't, we don't carry out that ministry during the millennium. Our work during that period is unto Jesus Christ. We carry out angelic functions during that period. Karabuga Sila Makaya. That's our work during the millennium. The ministers at the millennial kingdom are the Jews. That's their time. That's their time of ministry. You know what they're going to be doing? What we already did 2,000 years prior. Oh, you didn't get it. And you, you, better, you better do what God called you to do. Because this is the time. This is the time of that ministry. After the, the trumpet sounds and we're caught up from here, we're done. Then the calendar of the Jews will continue. Because right now it's suspended. And it was to be suspended for two days, 2,000 years. At the end of 2,000 years, it resumes for seven years only. Then they enter into the millennial reign when we come from heaven with Jesus Christ. To set up his kingdom the headquarters being in Jerusalem. Jesus is not going to be functioning as king of the Jews in Jerusalem. No, he will function as king of the whole world. The king of Israel at that time will be David. All David is coming back. <laughs> Well, the Bible says so. He'll be back and reign over Israel. Jesus over the whole world. And we with him carrying out angelic functions. It's going to be wonderful. going to be wonderful but all that is you know in preparation for the judgment because we're going to judge angels preparation for the judgment and then after the judgment we move into the holy city i told you about that yesterday we'll be in the new earth glory be to god So, he says, I serve God with my spirit in the gospel of his son. Do you remember that lady, Anna? You remember? In St. Luke's gospel chapter 2, right? She, she did something so beautiful. So beautiful. The Bible tells us she served God. With fastings and prayer night and day. Night and day. But you know, the, the, way, the way it's written in the King James, you think she fasted and prayed every night and every day. No, that's not. She, she served God with fastings. 
fastings on the one hand, which means at certain times she fasted. Then she prayed night and day. Do you get it? Okay. Not like the fasting and praying together because we're used to putting the two together, fasting and praying, fasting and praying, praying and fasting, fasting and praying, praying and fasting. So if you, if you got fasting and praying night and day, you say the two together night and day. If she did that night and day, she'll never eat. Right? But she'll be dead. <laughs> okay. So um, we're in verse 9 in Romans chapter 1. For God is my witness to my soul with my spirit in the gospel of his son. But without season, I make mention of you always in my prayers. Making requests if by any means, now at length, I might have a prosperous journey by the will of God to come unto you. Hmm. That's wonderful. Are you following what he's saying here? For I long to see you. That I may impart unto you some spiritual gift to the end it may be established I long to see you that I may impart unto you some spiritual gift to the end you may be established I long to see you that I may impart unto you some spiritual gift for what purpose that you be established, strengthened, made stable, rugged, tough. Some spiritual gift. What kind of gift could this be that will make you stalwart? It's amazing. It's not in plural. He didn't say some spiritual gifts. But it says some spiritual gift. For the purpose of you being established. In part. Metadidomi. Metadidomi means to to share with to share with so he's saying I'm, I'm gonna give from what I got share with you impart you with what I got but here's an interesting thing second Corinthians chapter 8 Let's read from verse 1. Moreover, brethren, we do you to wit of the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia. The grace of God bestowed. Didomi. Same word except that the other one is with. So this was given to them. He says this grace was given to them. There he says, I want to give you some spiritual gift. Here he tells us, of this grace of God that was given, bestowed on the churches of Macedonia. He, he didn't say on all churches, this is a special grace. This is a special grace. Now let's keep reading. You're going to observe something. How that in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded on to the riches of their liberality. 
for to their power I bear record. Yea, and beyond their power, they were willing of themselves, praying us with much entreaty that we would receive the gift and take upon us the fellowship of the ministering to the saints. And this they did, not as we hoped, but first gave their own serves to the Lord and unto us by the will of God. Wonderful. In so much that we desired Titus, that as he had begun, so he would also finish in you the same grace also. This is wonderful. So he says, we, we desired Titus to complete in you the same grace. So Titus is supposed to minister this grace to the Corinthian church. Paul tells them about this grace in the Macedonian churches. But the Corinthian churches started first. In other words, they were the, they were the first churches, okay, ahead of the Macedonian churches. And they had amazing manifestations of the Spirit. They were known to be gifted in many things. But there was something that Paul hadn't observed with them. This grace. Let's read. In so much that we desire Titus that as he had begun, so he would also finish in you the same grace also. Therefore, as he abound in everything, in faith, and utterance, and knowledge, and in all diligence, and in your love to us, see that he abound in this grace also. See, um, I, I, let's read from the NIV first. It says, but just as you excel in everything, in faith, this church, they excelled in everything. Just as you excelled in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in complete earnestness, and in your love for us, see that you also excel in this grace of giving. They hadn't excelled in the grace of giving. There are people who are just like this. They're knowledgeable. They've got a lot of faith in, in accomplishing Nice things for God. They are mighty in speech. The great orators. Very loving. But the grace of giving may be very low. And then Paul says here, see that you also excel in this grace of giving. You have people who have the grace of receiving. No, it's true. Because there are people who don't know how to receive. So some, some know how to receive from God. And they even help others receive. I mean, remember, we got a book on how to receive a miracle and retain it. So you can teach how to receive. Not everybody knows how to receive. But the grace of giving is different. That's why you find people who have maybe not a lot and yet they joyfully give. It's just in them to give. They're always wanting to give. And you also have people who don't have a lot but they will not give. 
they would rather die than give the, the little that they have, even if that little will not do anything more for them. They will protect it with their life. They're going to hold, they'll hold on to it. It's not even good what they're holding, but they will still hold on to it. Because it's a certain kind of stinginess. See? Yeah. You can be, you can be poor and proud. Yeah, you can be poor and proud. Because many times people think that it's only a, a rich or powerful person in some position that can be proud. No, no, no. You can be poor and proud. Two peas. <laughs> yeah, poor and proud. And frankly, I've seen some. Very poor and very proud. Oh, yeah. Very poor, very proud. And they look at you narrowly like, what are you trying to tell me? And they don't know anything. And they are poor plus that, which means ignorant, poor, and proud. And those three working together, not good. Not good at all. Not good at all. And you can be very rich and stingy. Yes. You see, giving has nothing to do with what you have or what you don't have. It's got nothing to do with what you have or what you don't have. You, you just have to learn to be in that position where God can use you. You just have to learn to be in that position where God can use you. Joyfully too, joyfully. If, if God, if God needed help, will he come to you? You say, ah, I hope he does. Maybe he already did. Maybe he already did. Question is, did you notice? Did you notice? Did you notice? So you train yourself, see, because when you hear someone say, they want to do a million dollars, a, a million uh, rhapsodies, a million copies of rhapsodies, what goes through your mind? That's a million copies of the same material. Going out to one million people. It's wonderful. It represents a lot of people. That's the way to think. But the same person, I was listening to. Um, a couple of testimonies a while ago, I think maybe it was you who said something about uh, they did a, a, a hundred and something thousand and then the, the following year they did a, a million or something like that or yeah, yeah, um, 120,000. Yes, in September. In September. By November, we had done 6.5 million And then copies. by November, yes, sir. they had done 6.5 million copies. That's progress. See, that's progress. 
you measure your progress too. You measure your progress. How, how are you doing with God? See? How are you doing with God? My offerings. I give offerings. I give offerings. I give my tithe. I give seeds. Right? These are things that the Bible teaches us to do. And I, I have to do them. That's important. God is not obligated to get in a lot of money to you just because you need it. No, you can need it. Doesn't mean it's going to come. There are things you're supposed to do in God's word. There are things you're supposed to practice. Like for your health. There are things you're supposed to do. That can guarantee your health and guarantee your continued supply in abundance. Those things are no rewards. They are not rewards. So he will not use them to reward you. He's not going to just, okay, uh, you've been serving me so nicely. I'm going to make sure you have money. No, you can serve God and be broke. Understand what I'm telling you? That's why we teach Rhapsody. We teach God's word in Rhapsody. So you can understand how to put God's word to practice. What you must believe in your heart. What you must say with your mouth. And what you must do. Your action. You believe it with your heart. You declare it with your mouth. And you live accordingly. If, you, if, if truly you are an heir of God, you will not measure yourself with how much this world says you have. You measure your capacity with your faith. You know that your resources are endless, incalculable, but your faith can bring them from the spirit realm into the material world. So how do you measure yourself and what you got? You measure yourself according to your faith. You use your faith. Again, if that our sister, what's her name again, the doctor? Again? Mozzo. All right, Dr. Mozzo. Think about it. Imagine if she used all the measurements of this world. There will be no child in that womb. There will be no child born. She used her faith. Her faith. She used her faith. She decided with her faith. She saw with the eyes of faith. That's, that's why you can say, I'm going to do. You know, what, what's your faith saying? What's your faith saying? It's according to your faith. If your faith can't do it, can't, it, can't, it can't be done. So your faith can do it. I'm lying on my bed and I'm thinking, uh, and I'm speaking in tongues. You know, this happens to me frequently. So I'm speaking in tongues and I'm, I'm getting the sense of my speaking in tongues that, that the Spirit of God is getting me to give something. So I'm, I'm, I'm speaking, okay, okay. It looks like, looks like God, God wants me to give 
do something, some, somebody. Then says, give so and so a hundred thousand dollars. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Okay, so, okay. So I take the phone. And I start making the contact. God's asking me to give you a hundred thousand dollars. Oh, really? Yeah. So I'm speaking in tongues. Another occasion. He says, give so and so one million dollars. Thank you, Lord. Okay, thank you, Lord. So I'm making the contacts. Yeah. God asked me to give you a million dollars. Pastor Chris. Yeah. Million dollars. God said so. And when God talks to me like that, I'm doing it immediately. My, I don't know how to procrastinate. Because if you wait too long, you're postponing your own blessings. Because when you act for God like that, act on his word, a huge blessing is coming to you. But you, you postpone that blessing by postponing your action. And you don't know what God wants to do. Sometimes it's your life. Sometimes it's more resources. For you, it doesn't matter. Whatever God's going to do, let him do. But you just want to obey God. You see, that's the best part of it. That, that's what I enjoy. The fact that God can talk to me and tell me, give so and so. See? And I like it. I love it. I love it. So, and I'm speaking in tongues. Because when, you know, when I'm warming up like that, I'm, I'm, I, the gift, the grace of giving is working. See, it's the grace. The grace of giving. Like I stay up the gift of prophecy. You see it? Or the gifts of healing. See? Same way I stay up the gifts of healing. I, I'm, if, 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 the word. The word teaches us how to do these things. The grace of giving is that way too. Stay it up, but make sure to do it. So you start walking. Look at what he said. Let's read that verse again. The last verse in the NIV. Look at what he said. He says, see that you also excel. Excel. Not just have it. Excel. In this grace of giving. So see that you also excel. But if you're always look, looking at, okay, what's left of what you've got, you, then that's not the grace. That is you struggling. See, struggling to make something happen. It doesn't happen that way. I was speaking in tongues. So, and um, they needed something in one ministry. Speaking in tongues, speaking in tongues, speaking in tongues. God said, give them five million dollars. I said, that's it, sir. It's done. Count it done. It's done. Didn't take me a couple of days to make sure. You see, once, once I say it, it's as good as law. 
when I've said it, it's done. You have to put a premium on words. If you want your words, if you want your words to be effective in the realm of the spirit, you have to put a premium on words. See? Put a premium on words. You say you're doing it, you're doing it. The Bible says, for he had no pleasure in fools. Thinking like this and acting like this propels you, propels you from glory to glory. There's no stopping you. No stopping you. It's upward and forward. That's my journey. Say, that's my journey. Upward and forward only. Say it again. Say, that's my journey. So it doesn't matter at what point, at what point you are. Don't look at it like that. Look at your faith. You see it? Whatever your faith can do right now, when you act on it, that's, that's what pleases God. For without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. See? So, at whatever level you are, respond to him as an act of your faith. Then, his grace will lift you. It says, he that is faithful in little is faithful in much. His grace will lift you from there to another level. You don't need to struggle. When you're acting according to the faith that the word has produced within you, you don't struggle. In fact, while you're doing it, you'll be excited because your faith is at that point. Once you have accomplished that, your faith has gained the mastery in that area. You lift it. Move to the next. Move to the next. Some adventure. Move to the next. And to win in that le next level, learn more of God's word. See? Because you've got to, you've got to soak in the word. Without the word, your, your faith will become flabby. See, but your faith needs to be strong. So you put the word to work. Meditate on the word. And put your faith to, to action. Put it to work. You'll be excited watching yourself grow. Watching yourself grow. It's one of the things I enjoy in my personal life. I enjoy seeing what the Holy Spirit is doing in my personal life. I get excited to see my personal growth. See? How, how am I responding to the things of God? What's my knowledge of God like? How is my fellowship with God improving? Increasing. Has my dealings with people. I like watching the changes in my personal life. I love it. Because that's the word of God in action. It's always new glory. See, it's from glory to glory, from faith to faith. See, you, you, you see that grace to grace is grace heaped upon grace. Hallelujah. You still there? 
So he said, I long to see you, that I may impart to you some spiritual gift that you may be established. Impart to you some spiritual gift. In chapter 9 of that second Corinthians, it tells you something beautiful. I've spoken for more than one hour, I can see. It looks like that, right? Okay. Maybe I should say the rest in tongues, right? <laughs> Glory be to God. Oh, Galira Goski Parananga Salis. Kora Sela Grade de Koshlaman de Kila Parhes. Remember, one of the things that I've stressed to you is praying in the Spirit, speaking in tongues. Don't ever forget it. Do it more and more in your life. There's no way of quantifying, estimating the, the capacity that you build within you by praying in tongues. And the things that you make possible in your personal life by praying in tongues. Are you hearing me? Plus that, you will be far more healthy. And the Holy Ghost will be giving you instructions. Instructions that will help you in everything, including your health. I'm focusing a little bit on, on health for a reason. We're in a world of poisons. And I kind of like it that the Lord Jesus, he told us, this signs shall follow them that believe. And one of the signs, he said, they shall, if they shall drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. Maybe later on, uh, I, I'll, I'll, I'll discuss that on your love of specials. Did you know we're talking about fluoride and the danger of fluoride in toothpastes, right? Did you know they have fluoride in milk? In some of the in some of the powdered milk you have, they got fluoride. Question is why? Incidentally, not in every country. Targeted. Targeted. So you see why more are having problems, they're getting cancers, heart trouble. There's a lot of bad food that many people are consuming. So the plan is to keep you visiting the hospital continually. So you become a, a permanent customer. But Jesus has a different plan for you. He has a different plan for you. And through speaking in tongues, you will be educated. You will be instructed. You will be guided by the Holy Ghost. 
there are things that other people may like and be, it might be nice for them. And God will tell you, no, 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 don't take that one. Learn to listen to the Holy Ghost. That's why I talk to you about speaking in tongues. I know what that has done for me. I've gotten tremendous guidance in my life through speaking in tongues. Speaking in tongues and then interpreting. Because sometimes you will, you will just know what the Holy Spirit is telling you within your heart. But sometimes you have to have the interpretation of those tongues to get the message. But whichever way the Holy Ghost wants to bless you and lead you, he was sent to help you. You have a helper in you who will guide you in the path of life. Do you understand? Hallelujah. Yes, in his presence is fullness of joy. At his right hand are pleasures evermore. Speaking in tongues right now. And those of you who are watching, speak in tongues right there where you are. Pray in the Holy Ghost right now. Pray in the Holy Ghost. The Spirit of God is ministering to you right now in this hour. Right now in this hour. Perfection, perfection in your health. Perfection in your body. From the crown of your head to the soles of your feet. Perfection in the name of the Lord Jesus. That breast lump leaves in the name of Jesus. That heart pain goes in the name of Jesus. The kidney problem ceases in the name of Jesus. Speaking tongues. Praying the Holy Ghost. Speaking tongues. Speaking tongues. The Holy Ghost is working in your body right now. Speaking tongues. The Spirit is ministering into your life right now. Speaking tongues. Praying the Holy Ghost. Praying the Holy Ghost.
Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Glory to God. You know, I was just, I was just thinking, we have several who shared testimonies with us here. I didn't think of the fact that there are many who were healed. Amazing miracles of healing. And then those who came back to life after being sick and dying. There's a man in the Bible. Hezekiah. Hezekiah was told by God sent a prophet to him and he said to him thus saith the Lord set your house in order for you shall die so the Bible says Hezekiah prayed to God he didn't want to die at that time he prayed to God in the Bible tells us while he was praying the prophet was on his way leaving the palace but God spoke to the prophet and said go back tell him I've heard his prayer I've seen his tears and I've added unto his days 15 more years. That's a lot of time for someone who was supposed to die, right? Not 15 more days. If he had 15 more days, he probably would say, okay, at least now I've got two weeks to reorganize myself. But God gave him 15 more years. Praise God. When you've been sick, what the devil likes to do is to target you again because you see, something made you get sick before. So whatever made you get sick before can make you sick again. Except you effect changes. You see that? You have to effect changes. So you say, well, the devil took advantage of the situation and I got sick. But now, no more. No more. No more. I'm not going to get sick again. Have you made the commitment that you'll not get sick again? How many of you have made that commitment? See, God doesn't want you sick. No, I'll not be sick. Here's a better one. I'll not be sick. Because we don't get sick. No, we don't get sick. No, 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 no. No, I, I got sick in my life at different times. In my learning period. And I was... I had to learn. I had to put the word of God to work. Even when I was bundled to the hospital, I refused to say I was sick. I said, so what's happening to you here? Well, I'm learning. So I was there. Ten days at the hospital. I still refused.
Well, in the end, I won. But that's, that's, that's a lot of years ago now. That's a lot of years ago. We're talking that's about 40 years ago. And I was born due to the hospital. Ten days in the hospital. So, in my growing years, I had to put my faith to work. While you're doing that, it can look like it's tough. But your Heavenly Father is watching you. The Holy Spirit is with you and is helping you. It's helping you. I'm marvelously helped. Do you know what? In this room, this room is saturated right now with the power of God. Saturated right now with the power of God. Saturated right now with the power of God. Hallelujah. It's saturated with the power of God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Glory be to God. Glory be to God. Glory be to God. Hallelujah! Thank you. Well, did you have a great time? So we're going to do a song. We're going to do a song in closing. But let me tell you, I, I mentioned to you yesterday that I have a special announcement for you. We're going to have a special reach out day throughout the world. In that particular day, we're taking rhapsodies everywhere. Everywhere. So, when I give you the date, we'll plan. Some places that may take some days to reach, you have to go days before. So that on the day, you will be there. And the rhapsodies will be there. We're going to distribute rhapsodies. We're going to organize ourselves all over the world. In their offices, in the shops, in the schools, in the barracks. Doesn't matter where. In the buses. Everywhere they will get rhapsody. Everywhere. Send out physical copies, digital copies. Everywhere we will saturate this world. And we will have the rhapsodies in different categories. When we give to Ma, Pa, we'll give the kids theirs. Lift your hand. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. It's all to your glory. Honor of your name. The whole world is yours. Everything is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Hallelujah. Now when we close... All our guests who wait behind in the auditorium while we have others dismissed so they can go home or to the hotel to rest. Praise God. And we'll also be saying goodbye to all of those who have been participating with us 
on the screen from their homes or wherever they join us. But we're so glad that you were with us. And for the previous sessions, we'll be showing the programs again and again. So make sure to watch. I'm sure you will be mightily inspired and blessed. We'll do it sits above the cherubim. Well, you all ready? And while we're doing this, I often don't like really um, while we're worshiping and songs to be doing the offering. It's often a distraction because when we're singing in praise, I really like to do it. So, um, but I don't have the orchestra here today. They're not here, are they? Oh, you are here. Oh, I didn't see you. Okay, so let the orchestra play and we give an offering. Okay, let's, let's give an offering to the Lord right now. We'll give you some details on the screen that you can use. Doesn't take a long time. It's just about four minutes, five minutes. So let's do that before we do our special praise song to the Lord.
Oh, wonderful. I'm not very sure what that tune was, but <laughs> sounded nice. Oh, dear. Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus, we thank you for the opportunity to honor you with our offerings, our seeds of faith. We've done it according to your word. And we receive a multiplied harvest of blessings on our giving in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We invoke these offerings and seeds of faith, the power of God, to cause them to multiply for the furtherance of the gospel. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, let's do this song. You sit above the cherub.
tonight and God bless you. want to do what 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 do you want to do the money will come are you hearing me